Hi, I am Jacob Stein, and I'm a partner in Allianz Los Angeles office, and I am the head of Allianz private client practice. Allianz is an international law firm, and in our private client practice, we represent families and individuals with respect to estate planning, tax planning, asset protection planning, moving wealth around the world. Uh, we represent both, uh, let's say, middle-class families who are just trying to hold on to what they have, and some of the world's wealthiest individuals engaging in some very cutting-edge sophisticated planning. Um, I've been practicing for many years. Uh, I have that knowledge with you in these very short videos. Um, a question we get from our clients uh, quite frequently is if I use an irrevocable trust, either for estate tax planning or to protect assets from claims of creditors, how do I retain control over my assets? And I think that's a great question. Retaining control over your assets is probably the very first question we get from every single client, right? We all want to hold on to what uh, we have. We want to retain control of our assets, right? We usually set up these structures. We use these structures not because you want to have an irrevocable trust, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want an irrevocable trust. That has never happened, right? It's just a tool that is intended to get us someplace. So we want to minimize any sort of uh, negative trade-offs uh, the irrevocable trust presents. And by the way, with any planning structure, state planning, tax planning, asset protection, right? There are often so many different options. Now, how do we pick from these different options? Well, they present different trade-offs. So within the revocable trust, the upside is that you get a fantastic level of protection from credit claims, right? For, so for asset protection, that's a great structure. The revocable trust can also be used for estate tax planning, for income tax planning, especially state income tax planning. But what is the downside, right? What is the trade-off? Well, the perceived trade-off that we need to minimize, and sometimes, sometimes it can be a real uh, downside, is the loss of control over the assets placed into the irrevocable trust. And if you think of a traditional irrevocable trust, you know, this goes back hundreds of years to, uh, you know, the Queen Elizabeth times or something like that. Um, an irrevocable trust would be a structure where you transfer the title of the assets to another person, the trustee of the trust, and they now own those assets for the benefit of the trust beneficiaries. You gave up on these assets. They have been transferred, they're gone, they are no longer yours. You have zero control. And obviously a structure like that is very concerning for many of our clients. You know, I don't want to give up control over my assets. So is there a way for us to transfer ownership of the assets uh, to trust and retain control? And fortunately today, there is such a way. Uh, so first of all, uh, there's been a lot of development over the past 10 or so years in how we draft the revocable trust. So now we are capable of drafting them in a way that every retains a lot more flexibility and allows us to retain control over the assets, like the ability to get the assets back, to not have any tax consequences on the transfers of the assets to and from the trust. Um, so how do we do that? One is by drafting the trust the right way. So for example, uh, the more traditional drafting of an irrevocable trust, you would have a sentence that says, this trust is irrevocable. And when you say that this trust is irrevocable, it's like it's a blanket prohibition. No one can revoke the trust. And what that means in the technical sense, revoking the trust, it means you cannot get the assets back from the trust. Revocable, irrevocable describes to the transfer of the assets to the trust. Is the transfer of the assets revocable or not? Right? So if the transfer is revocable, you have the right to get your assets back. If the transfer is irrevocable, you cannot get your assets back. We, the legal community, have realized over the past 10 years that we do not need to draft the trust with such a blanket prohibition. We need to remove from our client the person setting up the trust, usually referred to as the settlor or the grantor, the ability to get uh, the assets back. But that's not the same as saying that that ability does not exist. So, uh, if for, for example, if I'm setting up an irrevocable trust and I transfer an asset to this trust, I cannot hold the power to get that asset back because if I have the power to get that asset back, the trust is deemed revocable um, and there is little benefit to a trust like that. So it has to be irrevocable. I cannot hold the power to get my assets back. But perhaps I can appoint someone else to hold that power. I can preserve that power in someone else, right? So I can appoint the person. Usually uh, we refer to this person as a trust protector 
and this trust protector can hold the power to revoke the trust. And we'll talk about trust protectors in more detail in another video, but just very briefly, a trust protector summon you appoint in addition to the trustee, and this person can hold broad powers over the trust, like the power to terminate the trust, to revoke the trust, to make changes to the trust, perhaps to change the trustee and the beneficiaries of the trust, right? And then use the set law will retain the power to decide who this protector will be. You'll have the, the power to fire the protector and appoint a new protector. So in an indirect way, you as the person creating the trust, as the person transferring the assets to the trust, you retain control over the assets of the trust. You retain control over the ability to get the, the assets back, right? The protector can change the trustee. You have the power to change the protector. What does that mean? You ultimately control the trustee and all the decisions that the trustee makes. You want your assets back tomorrow because the asset protection need has passed. Well, the protector can take an action, right? To change the beneficiaries of the trust, make you the beneficiary or just to return the assets to you. The pr protector refuses to do so. Well, you have the power to fire the protector and perhaps appoint someone else. So nowadays, irrevocable trust can be drafted in a way to retain a lot more control, uh, a lot more flexibility, and most importantly, you can get your assets back if you really want to. Uh, and these trusts can be drafted to have no tax consequences, no income tax consequences, no estate tax or gift tax consequences. Uh, yeah, these are beautiful structures. Uh, they're amazing for protection. They're amazing for estate tax planning, income tax planning. I'm a big fan of irrevocable trusts. We probably draft and set up close to 100 irrevocable trusts every single year. I've been doing this for over 20 years. And I will tell you from my practical experience, these are structures that work really well. Uh, we use irrevocable trusts to protect all kinds of assets. Uh, most often, I would say the primary residence, right? Uh, the home you live in, the irrevocable trust is the perfect structure for that. But all kinds of assets, so we can place shares of stock into a trust, uh, liquid assets like bank accounts, intellectual property, uh, interests in other legal entities, right? And LLCs and limited partnerships. Uh, all sorts of assets can be transferred into an irrevocable trust. And in another video, we'll talk about the pros and cons of using irrevocable trust. Uh, thank you for listening to this video. And if you have any questions in asset protection planning, please call me. I'm Jacob Stein. Thank you.